I would sit on the edge or in the cockpit of my boat and just look around and watch the water and just think about how beautiful this place was. I mean, there, there was nothing there, but just how beautiful it was with the water being so calm and it being warm and thinking this is really a, a paradise. I was just living for the moment and the beauty and the, the day. Each and every day was a glorious day. <laughs> that was good enough for me. After the Civil War, prominent railroad companies were heading out west in search of areas to set up ports. At the time, the West Coast was wide open and they were all hungry to expand their shipping range. The Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railway considered the area of what is now Marina del Rey and Playa del Rey to be a worthy place to build a large-scale commercial harbor. The area provided a perfect portal to the domestic and international shipping opportunities they were after. The company partnered with prominent real estate developer and former attorney Moses Langley Wicks. Wicks had already played a part in the development of Lancaster, Glendale, San Bernardino, and many other Los Angeles communities and was looking to expand his reach. In 1886, they created the Bologna Harbor and Improvement Company with a capital stock of $300,000 to dredge out Port Bologna. The plan was to turn a quiet seaside marshland into a major commercial harbor to be named Port Bologna, but it wasn't quite so simple. Port Bologna was supposed to be big enough to house all the ships in the world. It was going to be a very large port, but the dreads that Moses Wicks had was inefficient. Physically, they couldn't do it. This dredging a harbor in here took uh, gargantuan means or a means that we didn't have available to us until the 1960s. While the attempt was valiant, wicked tides and winter rain swept the sand back into the channel almost as fast as the dredger scooped it out. It couldn't get down through some bouse or some clay mud about 10 feet below, so they had trouble dredging. Finally, when a major storm in 1889 carried away most of what was built, the project was abandoned. In three years of relentless trying, the venture was scrapped and the area returned to local duck hunters. Things were quiet for the next 12 years until 1902 when Moses Sherman and Eli Clark formed the Beach Land Company. This group owned about a thousand acres around the Bologna Lagoon, including Port Bologna, and renamed the area Playa del Rey. Beach of the King. They sold lots and created a destination for day tourists, but the area that would one day be the largest man-made harbor in the world was still essentially marshland. The last attempt at a commercial harbor was when millionaire Abbott Kinney met with the U.S. Corps of Engineers in 1916. He believed the space would have better protection for fishing and commercial small craft than Los Angeles Harbor. He also asserted that the location was superior by virtue of its proximity to downtown Los Angeles. No federal action was taken. At the beginning of the Great Depression in 1929, the Ohio Oil Company brought in a wildcat well east of what is now the Marina Peninsula. They started drilling wells on which were now plot planned 30 foot lots on both sides of what is now the Silver Strand. At a time of unprecedented economic suffering, the vast majority of local homeowners demanded that zoning laws be changed to allow oil extracting equipment on their lawns. This area was um, uh, littered with oil wells and oil production material. 
beach houses in Venice, uh, right on the beach, would have oil wells in their side yards. Uh, everybody wanted an oil well. The beach was filled with derricks. In two years, there were almost 150 oil wells in production. At full strength, what was then known as the Playa del Rey field produced almost 47,000 barrels of oil and 2 million cubic feet of gas daily. When the oil field reached 340 wells in 1931, with 38 different companies on 10 acres, it became the fourth most productive oil field in the state. By early 1932, the area was nearly depleted. Everybody was greedy. They're putting more oil wells down, getting oil and the pressure diminished, of course. And so this started in the late 20s and went through about 1945 about. And I remember an editorial in the Herald Express that said, stop this forest of derricks. While many local residents and companies made money during this miniature boom, the environment took a beating. What was once a pristine coastal paradise was looking more like an oil-stained dump. It became a noisy, smelly, dangerous oil field that was no longer earning its keep. After the oil production started to peter out, uh, they polluted the land so much that it was uh, impossible to be used as residential land. The actual area of the marina was so polluted they, they couldn't really do anything. And so as worthless land, it was a lot either easier to assemble it and into one coherent block and to develop it. It was mosquitoes who enjoyed this dank, dirty place next to the Blue Pacific more than anyone else. It eventually became infested with the bugs, and Los Angeles County was forced to create an abatement plan to protect residents from what was essentially a local scourge. The area was ugly, and the abatement costly, so by the late 30s, politicians began to re-examine what could be done. With a failed attempt at a commercial harbor in the distant past and a catastrophic flooding disaster of Bologna Creek in 1933, the notion of turning the site into a substantial recreational harbor began to take shape. Local advocates wrote to Congressman John Dockweiler, who eventually introduced a bill to establish a harbor at Playa del Rey Inlet. The Regional Planning Commission submitted a report in 1938 entitled Marina del Rey. This report emphasized the harbor would service the recreational needs of an already large and growing number of boaters in the area. Prior to World War II, proposals were exchanged on a federal level discussing the feasibility of such a harbor in the Playa del Rey area. After the war, these discussions began again. By the late 40s, local advocates like Rex Thompson and Arthur Will began the push to transform the former oil field into a modern harbor and community. With President Dwight Eisenhower now at the helm of the country, transportation-related issues were considered with more seriousness. The Army Corps of Engineers had earlier created an underwater wall alongside Bologna Creek, built for more effective drainage of the city. Unintentionally, the wall created a deeper body of water where the present marina sits. Lake Los Angeles, or Mud Lake as it was known, became a recreational hotspot for small sailboats and ski boats in the 1950s and was a preview of what the future would hold. In 1954, President Eisenhower signed Public Law 780 that allocated $7,738,000 to the construction of the Playa del Rey Inlet. That would later be renamed Marina del Rey. In December of 1957, ground was broken and construction began in what was to be the world's largest recreational harbor. It aimed to birth 8,000 pleasure craft and serve a growing Los Angeles population. Through the early 50s and on into the 60s, politicians like Rex Thompson and Burton Chase worked tirelessly with state and federal officials to ensure the project became a reality. 
Chase, often called the father of the marina, is said to have understood the business element of Marina del Rey with great clarity. He was committed to ensuring that the foundational economic premises be adhered to, that the marina be a solvent money-generating entity for the county of Los Angeles. The first boats arrived in 1962, and Marina del Rey was a reality. While the harbor was carved out and contracted to spec, what Army Corps engineers didn't realize was that the natural topography combined with the new man-made topography caused powerful surges during times of stormy weather. Specifically what happens is in a marina like this, the docks float uh, to accommodate for the tide so that the, the dock and the boat are at the same height to one another and they keep the docks in place by on pilings and so the dock is free to float up and down guided and kept in place on these pilings. When they did that in Reno del Rey they didn't account for what could happen if there was strong surge and <clears throat> harmonic waves getting in phase uh, and the waves would suddenly be several feet higher than the design height of the pilings. So suddenly all this stuff is churning about like a washing machine and it resulted in some great sections of docks floating around with their boats attached, some boats floating around not attached to anything, some docks floating around not attached to anything. So this was the wake-up call. They had seen the full-scale model and suddenly they understood what the problem was. Frequently when uh, you have prideful engineers uh, that didn't recognize the problem immediately and suddenly are confronted with it, say, oh, well, of course, we'll do this. The marina went through a couple of versions of that, uh, uh, two sets of, we'll call them the wave disruptors, walls that protruded, protruded from the entrance channel about two-thirds across from one direction and two-thirds across from the other direction with a gap for the boats to go through. And the idea is that waves would come and the energy would be dissipated with these walls. But they weren't up to the job. A tremendous amount of energy can be generated and they soon discovered that wasn't enough and uh, uh, decided they would do a thorough engineering study. And uh, then they came up with the idea of, well, let's build a wall outside the entrance and maybe the waves will hit the wall. And uh, they tried that in the model and darned if it didn't work. And so they started doing it uh, um, uh, full scale and here it is and it's worked pretty well. Wetland conservation is called the development of Marina del Rey, the single most devastating blow to the protection of local wetlands. In the late 50s to the early 60s, 900 acres of hollowed land was destroyed for its construction. In its place, in 1962, a new harbor community was born. Today, Marina del Rey harbors thousands of boats and is a world-renowned port of call. And now, at over 50 years old, is on the precipice of a complete overhaul and redevelopment. Like the initial construction, this undertaking is full of political wrangling and disagreement, but once complete, will continue to be one of the most prominent harbors in the world. <laughs>